So, welcome back, and uh, we have an, another exciting you know, panel uh, that going in, into more, uh, uh, just uh, deepening the issue. And, and I would like to give the floor to our next speaker, who is Andrew Smith, um, Director General of International Political Affairs Bureau of Global Affairs Canada. And, uh, and, and really, I want to, to, to ask him, you, you know, Canada has a, has a kind of had a long-standing role in the international community to promote peace and justice at the global level. So I really would like to, to ask you, in the current context, which are some of the, the needed actions that we need to really ensure and preserve the peace element and actually the sustainable peace that, you know, for the future. And you, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, and, and, and thank you for inviting me today to, to be a part of this panel. Um, first, maybe we'll just say in the context of the, the, the broader theme of today's um, discussion about flipping the script that um, at, at a kind of macro level with the role that Prime Minister Trudeau is playing as co-chair of the SDG advocates. I think that's that's certainly an area where we can we can try as as Canada to you know to get the word out to 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 ensure that the you know the SDGs um, and and the comprehensive nature of the SDGs is, is well understood and and, and is um, and is advocated for globally. So just. Then turning to your question on, on peace and security, of course, you know, focusing on SDG 16 is important, but I think aligning that with um, with Canada's feminist approach um, and and the importance of SDG 5 really is foundational to the success of the of, of Agenda 2030 and, and the SDGs um, more broadly. I, I think that's I think that's very important. And what what we've seen and what we understand is the importance of gender equality. In terms of social stability, and um, and that you know we we recognize that um, countries where women and girls are, are treated equally, we see that the 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 relationship between between peace and, and gender equality is very strong, um, and this is really why I think Canada sees the, the the very strong connection between SDG 16 and SDG. And in, and in practical terms, what that means for Canada is that we have a national action plan um, on women, peace, and security. In 2019, we appointed our first um, ambassador for uh, women, peace, and security, Jacqueline O'Neill. Um, and, and then through, uh, through the Women, Peace Builders uh, initiative uh, at, at the UN, um, we have, uh, we've, been, we've been furthering the, the role of of women peace negotiators and you know according to UN women um, when women are included in peace processes the agreement um, is 35 percent more likely to last 15 years so the role of, of, of women in peace and security is, is is essential Canada has also been um, pushing what we call the ELSI initiative for women in peace operations since 2017 uh, and then that was a five-year pilot in 2022. We extended that for another five years. And the idea there is to increase meaningful participation of women in peace, UN peace operations, with the focus on military and police roles. And with that, Canada has also worked with the UN, um, and UN Women, to establish the multi-donor LC initiative fund for women uh, for uniformed women in peace operations. So. Clearly, women play a vital role in ensuring peace and security and can be actively engaged in peace building and peacekeeping. Um, but beyond that, we recognize that gender equality is a driver that contributes to peace and security in addition to media freedom, strong civil society, uh, digital inclusion, open government, justice, and, and, and strong governance institutions. And then just also to note that um, youth participation, um, we, we recognize that as a vital contributor to, to uh, sustainable peace and security. Um, just in wrapping up, I, I do want to note that, you know, you know, today we're looking at how, how do we move the LDC agenda forward with the, the new program of action in the context of, of Agenda 2030. 
But also, I think it's important to note that, that the program of action extends beyond 2030. And that I think now, as we, as we you know, consider the SDG Summit this September, what, what does it mean going forward beyond 2030? Um, how do we maintain the momentum that was built with the SDGs? And, the, and I think the, you know, the comprehensive nature of the SDGs and, and the, the, the um, I guess, the, the broad commitment the SDGs within the UN system, and how do we how do we maintain that momentum in the context of, of the program of action of the UN 2030? So with that, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, I think you, you you made a very important point. First of all, on Goal 16, on, on the importance of, of peace and and important role that women play in, into preventing and and doing into um, peace negotiation for you know sustainable peace and also you mentioned um, you know you mentioned the importance of, of linking the SDG the program of action that actually goes beyond 2030 and I think it's you, you made a very important point of, of, of please remind you know member states everyone not to look at these processes in isolation. So we should not say, okay, now we meet again in 10 years for LDC 6, uh, and then the SDG summit is separate. We need to agree and to share a common framework because all these processes are connected and, and we need to leverage each one to really push the agenda further. So I think it is important to agree and, and to build from Doha to New York and then to further conference to push the agenda forward. And last, uh, you, you talk about youth. I mean, we, we had, um, we discussed it in the earlier session and you went on the importance of civil society. And, and I'm very, you know, this is actually the perfect, uh, um, you know, please for, for my next speaker, and uh, as you know, uh, actually I, I was engaged in some of the session in parallel to the to, to the very events. Uh, there is a civil society forum. I was amazed by many of the discussions, really tackling the key issues within country, but also of the global financial architecture, or you know, some of the climate change, gender equality, some of the food policy and, and it's a really a pleasure to, to have tonight with us uh, Million Lilay, who is the general coordinator of Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa and, and he's really hoping to bring you know, some of the perspectives, some of the energy and, and some of the ideas and the action that have been discussed uh, uh, you know, just uh, uh, in the next so. so uh, so, Million, uh, from your perspective and also from the conversation you had uh, with your with other civil society leaders across LDC and also more, what is the single most important action which is needed to achieve the SDGs in, L in LDC? Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm so happy to be here. I'm so happy to be here. Such a lovely music from my sister in Nigeria. Um, LDCs, you know, uh, 33 of the 46 LDCs are from Africa, 71%. Um, I don't want to go back to the main reason of why we are there. Um, it's very much historical, it needs analysis. Um, and to some extent, that's a lot of people say it's deliberate that we are there. Um, we have no time to do that, uh, but the majority of them are uh, practicing agriculture. You know. <coughs> so practical. And their main life is agriculture. Burkina Faso, 90%. Ethiopia, over 80%. My country. Uganda, where I'm living now, more than 70%. So, the majority of them hover around that in agriculture. So the question is what kind of agriculture? I think I hear in the corridors of this meeting and other meetings, the proposal is productivity, more production, the kind of productivity agriculture. 
and maybe the components are the green revolution. So in 2013, the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa have asked this question, particular question, what kind of agriculture? And we say agroecology, but does agroecology work in Africa? So we did research. Um, if you go to our website, you can find more than 100 case studies. Now, the research is piling up, you know, in, in most countries. So, question again is, is there any relationship or does agroecology address SDGs? So we did a comparison, you know, that is the case studies and what percentage of those case studies address um, the SDGs. So, we picked 50 of these this case studies in random. No poverty, I think uh, the first one, 54% of them address it. Zero hunger, 100%. Good health and well being, 22%. Quality education, 62%. Gender equality, 74%. Clean water and sanitation, 28%. Decent work and economic growth, 54%. Social consumption, 66%. And climate action, 42%. But that was, this analysis was done long time ago. If we do this analysis again, I think the figure will, will change, especially the climate action. I think we have heard from the, our uh, Malawian uh, uh, colleague that you know, one of the capacity buildings that he said is that you know, when you are hit by drought and accidents, it's very difficult for you to address a climate crisis very difficult. Now, uh, yesterday we launched a study, we meaning, uh, I'm also a member of the International Panel of uh, Experts on the Sustainability of Food Systems, IPS Food, uh, linking debt and uh, sustainable food systems. In terms of uh, climate, it's very difficult to, ad to, to, to address climate crisis because we are in debt. Debt servicing actually is putting these LDC countries into much more borrowing. We borrow, um, we have a crisis, but we pay. See, we are, we, are in a, we are in a cycle. So I think the one and single solution for us, for the African civil society, which composes, which composed of uh, farmers' networks, fisher folks' networks, pastoralist networks, indigenous people's networks, consumers' networks, women networks, youth networks, that's what I've said, is agroecology. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Miriam, for, for your uh, you know, very, very important um, point on, on that. You know, we are in a, in a, in a debt crisis, and, and these, this could be actually one of the action that, this, that, that the SDG summit can embrace. You know, towards to allow you know governments to really invest beyond you know the payment of debt in the achievement at, at, at the national level of the SDGs, and also you mentioned about the agroecology. So how we can produce uh, and consume food in a way that is sustainable, that protect the environment, and ensure. Um, Equality, you know, between you know people, and and you also reminded us how, you know, the majority of the population in NDC in Africa are dependent on, on rural economy, and so this is a, a key single action. So thank you. And now it's a it's a really pleasure, you know, we talked uh, earlier about uh, expanding, you know, human capabilities and, and we talk about many aspects of the human development because the SDGs in a way embody uh, the whole concept of human development. So um, we are very privileged to have with us uh, Heriberto Tapia who is one of the senior advisors to the well-known human, human Development Report. And uh, Heriberto, uh, as you, as, as your last report mentioned uh, very clearly, we live in a world of worries. A new uncertainty complex is emerging, never before seen in human history. However, in this difficult and unsecure context, the latest human development report shows us 
the hopeful way forward. How we can navigate uncertainty while expanding human development. So what practical choices can be made to ensure human development uh, you know, progress? Roberto. Thank you so much, uh, Marina, for the invitation. Uh, before going to the, to the question, uh, let me uh, first uh, describe this uncertainty complex. So we have always uh, experienced uncertainty, but now what is new is that we have different layers of uncertainty. We have the Anthropocene, so the fact that humans are able to change radically the planet in a dangerous way. We also, we also have transformations that are taking place like in the digital world. And also we have uh, polarization, increasing polarization. So, Something key to consider is that these new layers of uncertainties are human-made. Uh, and therefore, it is possible to turn things around. Something also important to note is that um, the, it's not only that the developing countries are experiencing some setbacks, let's say, in rising levels of poverty. Also, in the countries, that uh, are considered developed, we see problems. We see rising levels of stress. Uh, we see like rising levels of insecurity. So there is something that is not going well. So and what we see is that what's not working is that people are losing the narrative of their lives. And I think here the key word is narrative because it's precisely that word probably is what is going to allow us to then flip the script. So now we are uh, facing the, 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 the a scenario where we can change things. Because if we know that things are changing in this uncertain world, if we know that we humans are responsible for those change, then we have the responsibility to make things change in the direction we want. And now how? Well, we, we are proposing uh, two families of uh, actions in order to address what we call mismatches between what we need and what we have. This is a different world, so we are forced to do something different. On the one hand, we need to improve things, close mismatches in, in, in terms of our institutions. And there we are proposing a strategy uh, based on three I's, innovation, insurance, and investment. Investment, because it's not financial investment, it's about being able to modify today things that we want different, in a different way tomorrow. It's about investment in human development, it's investment about in, 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 in public goods. Insurance, because we need to provide a sense of security of people in order to face the changes. Innovation, not because of voluntarism, it's quite the opposite. It's because we need to be humble. We don't have uh, the solutions uh, at our hands. Institutions that used to work now are not working, and therefore we need to create things that are new. Just an example, our Human Development Index is defined in a way that it's like going from point a to point B, from developing to developed. That context is not very relevant anymore. We need to be able to rethink even the indicators that we have. The second part is culture. I am an economist. Uh, in my first class of economics, we were always taught that, for instance, the demand curve was uh, the, the quantity demanded was, was depending on prices culture, taste, etc., etc., but then we would forget about this part. But what we see in, time, in times of change is that culture is fundamental. We cannot forget about it. And in order to tackle culture, we're proposing a strategy based on three elements. On the one hand, we need more education and a different education, not an education based on just creating human capital. It's about changing our values. 
uh, improving the way we, we live and cooperate with each other. Also, we need recognition. We need to be open to different forms of knowing, and including, for instance, what happens with indigenous groups. And also, we need uh, more representation. We need more voices, including, of course, the voices of uh, civil society. So this is critically important. Uh, we are going to be publishing in the next few weeks a, a, a report about gender social norms, for instance. It's something so important. We are reaching a point where we cannot make further progress in our policies toward gender if we don't change social norms. This is, these are policies that are priceless in the sense that they are very important, but at the same time they are costless. To, to act differently doesn't cost a dollar. So just to close, um, I think we, we, we live uh, very interesting times. There is a sense of possibility. So now the challenge is to move to a situation of unintended consequences, which is where we are, to a, to, to a, to a story of successful intended change. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eriberto. Uh, thank you for, for you. You made very important points about, uh, first of all, the, the three I's, so innovation, investment, insurance. But also you talked about uh, these possibilities. And also you mentioned something which is very important for us at the SDG Action Campaign, which is the importance of culture. Culture which is education, which is, again, investing in the potential of people, but also of the recognition of the different kind of knowledge, of the diversity, of, of, of somehow this, uh, the diversity that we have and, and, and the richness if we accept and embrace the diversity. And then the third point is about participation, is about inclusion, is about, again, embracing in all processes, in all decision-making processes, the diversity and the different perspective. And you talked again about possibilities. And I, and, I, and I think this is for the Flip the Script campaign is very important, how we can really together embrace this change and, and, and leverage every, every tool and, and particularly culture to embrace the change. And I think this point uh, is, is a very important for me to link uh, to the last speaker before we did before no the to be making the closing or remarks so the last speaker of the panel which is uh, uh, Janine um, El Mkab from the Canon uh, program of, of, of young leader and uh, uh, we uh, you know we believe in, in in the power of creativity and actually in the power of storytelling and leveraging art in all its form to tell a new story. And, to, and this story can shape a new reality, which is the reality of the SDGs. And uh, so uh, we, we really believe in, in, the, in the creative sector. And, and the creative economy is not only one of the most rapidly growing sector, but it's also a highly transformative one. What is the role of the creative sector and of this multi-partnership in achieving the SDGs? Janine, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, well, first of all, I just want to thank you for having me on this panel and uh, for all the other panelists. Uh, as for your question with how the creative sector, the creative industry and partnerships support the SDGs. Well, first of all, uh, Canon is a creative tech company. We enable creativity. Um, and we are trying to make a different sort of social impact through creativity. Uh, so Canon runs a number of social initiatives. We have the Canon Young People Program, which I'm going to focus more about uh, during this panel. We have limited time. But we also have other programs, like the Mauritian Program, which runs in Africa. So what we do is we work with Canon ambassadors uh, to support participants that are part of these education programs so that we can support them in creating content, so stories and images that push for, go, where push for awareness um, and raise awareness around important sustainability issues in alignment with the UN SDGs. And uh, 
currently, so starting today, actually, we kicked off a three-day Canon Young People program that is going to run from today until the end of this conference. So drop by to Moon 101 if anyone wants to have a look. Uh, but before I proceed, let me give you some background on what the Canon Young People program is. So the objective of the program is to support and to empower and to give a voice to young people so that they can push for change, raise awareness around important sustainability issues that are important to them, something they might be facing themselves, using the power of visual storytelling. And we do this by working with young people from underrepresented communities. So we currently also have uh, some exhibitions running in this uh, conference, I'm sure you've seen them. If you come in from the parking lot, the tunnel, you'll see a lot of images, and then there's another one down the exhibition hall. If you haven't seen them, please do pass by. The images are great and the stories are even better. Uh, so these images uh, were taken by our young people and by our ambassadors in their own communities, which are part of the LDCs. And this exhibition, this conference is important to us because it's one of those few opportunities that we get to really uh, bring together a global audience around these important uh, stories that our young people are trying to get out there, they're trying to communicate to everyone. And that's part of our promise to these young people. So it's not only to work with them and empower them, but to really get their message out there and help them push for change. So we have access to a huge global audience here with a massive range. So the range is anywhere from youth delegates to government representatives that our young people now have their stories told to, hopefully pushing for change. So why are we doing all of this? These, uh, all these programs, these initiatives, these partnerships where we've continuously uh, worked together time and time again to try and deliver uh, impact on ground. It's to ensure that we offer these young people from these underrepresented communities the opportunities and the chances that they usually do not have access to, they, the, they usually will not be offered these opportunities, unfortunately. And it is these young people from these communities that will usually have the best and most captivating stories to tell. So they're usually the ones facing these uh, environmental and social sustainability issues that we're talking about today. So they will usually have the best stories to tell and they will be the most passionate to push for change. So through Just the Young People program, uh, we have collaborated with over 50 NGOs and entities, some of them being UN Women, uh, UNDP, and others. Uh, we've reached over 6,000 young people since 2016. I believe the exact number is 6,758, could be wrong, uh, in 27 countries. Keeping in mind these are 2022 numbers. We have run multiple programs <coughs> since 2023, and it's only been three months, so it's very, very exciting times for us. Uh, so just to, to wrap up, I'm conscious of time, I am the last speaker. Uh, this program, what we're trying to do is, in summary, we're trying to empower and support these young people. We're giving them a voice. We're giving them the tools they need and the training they need to not only talk about important globalized issues and topics, uh, but to push for change using their own stories, their own work, in, in putting that power in their hands, uh, and to push for change across the media. Thank you. Thank you. And, and, and thank you for you know for all for, for giving the visibility to all these very powerful and in most cases positive stories that need to be told to again shape a new reality. Now it's really a privilege to, to welcome our last speaker who will be giving the, the closing remarks. I really wanna wanna thank the the European Commission for International Partnership, Jutta Ophilainen, because she had a, an, an event organized by the Commission that she really wanted to be with us uh, to share her vision from Doha to the SDG Summit. So, Commissioner, you know, we, you, you being, you know, the European Union and the Commission is a key player and is a key agent for, 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 for change. Uh, in the in for the SDG. So, what are the key actions that you are you see necessary from from Doha to make the SDG summit a success? You have the floor. Thank you very much, and thank you for giving me this opportunity to jump in <laughs> and and also give my remarks. Uh, I have to say that it's a great pleasure to to. Play
close this very inspiring uh, session. We need, indeed need to flip the script towards prosperity and action. I could not agree more. And actually, we have had too many setbacks in the implementation of the SDGs, even before the COVID-19 crisis and the Russia's brutal invasion of Ukraine. But what is my main message today is that the SDGs are more important than ever. They are more important than ever. And I personally see, and the European Union sees, that we now have a window of opportunity with the upcoming SDG summit to really revitalize our efforts. And for us, for the European Union, the SDGs are the compass for action. And I have very uh, three, three points which I would like to make. My first point is that the EU will adopt the first comprehensive voluntary review of our internal and external SDG implementation. And this will be presented at the UN's high-level political forum next July. So we are working on this review uh, uh, at the moment. And I think this review actually shows our commitment to the 2030 agenda. Moreover, it stresses our determination to really use the SDG summit in September to make this agenda move forward. My second point is that the EU Global Gateway Strategy contributes to the implementation of the SDGs. We are definitely committed to the OGA target of 0.2% share of GNI, but we have to be honest, the OGA alone is not enough. We need more ODA, definitely, but we also need more investments. So Global Gateway is an investment strategy to connect the world, including least developed countries, in a sustainable and rule-based way. It is about investing in key areas like energy, digital, transport and climate. In addition to hard infrastructure, it also delivers in health, education, and skills. So Global Gateway will contribute to a range of interlinked SDGs in each of its investment priorities, leveraging private investments to the same cause. So this is our strategy, really, to get private funding also to the SDGs. And we will do this with EU member states, in a united, more impactful Team Europe approach. And my third point is that reducing inequalities, including in the least developed countries, remains a key EU priority. That's the reason, by the way, why I became a politician. I wanted to fight inequalities. That's the reason why I'm here. So this is also critical for accelerating SDG progress. Inequalities are at the heart of the 2030 Agenda. They cut across economic, social and environmental dimensions of sustainable development. And actually we are matching this political commitment with very concrete actions. i give you a couple of examples. We are fighting tax evasion and corruption. That's necessary. That's necessary. We are investing in shock-resilient social protection systems, human development, and education in partner countries most in need. We decided to increase our investments in education from 7% to 13%. 13% of our external funding goes to education projects worldwide. And we work as Team Europe and, and through partnerships. So, we have defined Team Europe initiatives, very concrete projects, which are Europe's offer to partner countries really to help development in certain areas. So these initiatives, they scale up resources and know-how as EU, its member states, and all Europe's national and multilateral development finance institutions pull together. 
In Bangladesh, our Team Europe initiative will improve social protection, demand driven skills training, and enhance access to quality education. A new regional Team Europe initiative on social protection in Sub Saharan Africa addresses major gaps, enhances resilience, and strengthens administrative structures. And something which I'm very proud of, I have to share this with you, we will launch very soon an innovative inequality marker, which we have been preparing together with the scientists and academia to better understand, track and in benchmark the impact of actions on inequalities capturing all dimensions. So we really want to understand that what is the impact of our activities to inequalities. So dear friends, I just want to go conclude by saying that Agenda 2030, that's the only realistic, agreed global blueprint for action to ensure a sustainable way forward. And we know, all of us, we know what to do. We must flip the script to prosperity and action, achieve our SDG targets, and build together a more sustainable and inclusive world for all. And we are committed to that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner. You made a very important point, first of all, on, on the emphasis of inequalities, and we look forward to, to learn more about this in initiative because inequality, tackling inequality is one of the key drivers for change. You also talk about social protection, and you also mention about uh, you know, tax evasion, which is a very important issue, and you also mention about corruption. And so, and, and you really emphasize that the SDGs are our only and shared agenda to build a more inclusive, peaceful, and sustainable future. Now, thank you. I want to thank all the participants, and I ask you to stay another two minutes because the event will be closed again by Seal, by a beautiful song from Nigeria, which talks about fighting corruption, but also talks about uh, it takes each one of us to make change happen at the national level. So I want to bring back Seal and Timmy to the stage, and I want to ask everyone to listen to them. Seal, please. So I hope this song inspired everyone here. Around today, we'll come back to tonight. The bridge we failed to fix.